Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, the phrase stronger together rang a bell with me. I've just been looking it up. Um, I must admit I thought it was something to do with the Remain campaign on that subject that we're probably all <laughs> sick about beyond words. Um, but in fact, it was a <coughs> slogan of, of Hillary Clinton's campaign. Um, it doesn't bode well for this discussion in that, in that respect. Um, are we stronger together? I suppose we, we need to, to, to dwell on a number of facets to that. But first of all, let's introduce the panel. Um, Professor Kip Jeffrey, I, I'm sure, is known to most of the um, participants today as head of the Camborne School of Mines. Um, I'll ask the participants to speak a little in a moment. Um, Marty Heitenen, is that correct? Um, is the CEO of the Finnish Minerals Group. Um, I'm Mark Rakavides. I'm president of Euromines. Um, I suggest, Kip, would you just like to say a little bit about yourself and uh, I'll sit down and do the same after Matty. From here, yes. Yes, as, as um, suits you, please. Yes, by way of introduction. Uh, um, I, I guess um, you would sort of put me in the category of academics, but I've actually had a career that spans um, a decade or more in industry in both mining in the UK and, and places like Australia. Um, i worked through a whole range of, uh, of allied areas from geotechnics right the way through to sort of business development and, uh, 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 and even into uh, strategic areas of industrial engagement between universities and, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and industry. Uh, and then latterly at the Camborne School of Mines, of course, we have a, um, a long history of working in the industrial collaboration area uh, as, as one of the sort of most industry aligned uh, departments. It's possible to have within the University of Exeter uh, and as such we you know train both the next generation of, of people working in, in the industry uh, engage in research uh, with them uh, uh, particularly to areas of improving the way that, that the sector both performs and the sort of technology it's got available uh, and work very closely with other colleagues in other disciplines to particularly address the new areas in which which the the industry is moving towards um, uh, as such, it's, uh, it's been a, a kind of 25-year run or so of, uh, of working with the, with the industry and have having the opportunity to visit <coughs> mining in most continents uh, and just get an idea for where the industry is going. Thank you very much, Kip. Uh, Martin, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. So, uh, my name is Matti Hietanen and uh, most of you perhaps uh, heard my presentation already yesterday. So, so I'm CEO of Finnish Minerals Group, which is uh, Finnish uh, government's uh, uh, holding a development company for, for the mining sector, and we also, also develop the, and facilitate the creation of uh, EV battery value chain in, in Finland. Uh, I'm also vice chairman of Terrafame, that is our subsidiary, uh, and uh, that is the uh, largest uh, nickel producer in, in Europe, uh, nickel mine. And, uh, and, and uh, I'm also uh, chairman of the board of uh, VTT Technological Research Center, which is one of the largest uh, uh, research uh, and technological research institutes in, in Europe. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mark Rakavides. I'm the president of Euromines. Uh, Euromines is, um, for want of a better description, the largest of the uh, European mining associations. We're the recognized industry body. Um, I've been president now for seven years. Um, we represent directly and indirectly um, about 150, 160 companies, um, ranging from the large companies that you're familiar with, the likes of LKB, Boliden, KJHM, K plus S, etc., um, to artisanal producers through their national associations. We cover the entire spectrum of metals and minerals, so we're not a coal lobby, we're not a bauxite lobby, we're not a gold lobby. We work for the entire industry. Um, our main activity is, of course, working with the European institutions, but we also work very much with um, member states, uh, with neighbouring states, with trading partners to the European countries, um, and vertically and across the industry with uh, academia, with um, adjacent industries, I, I like your phrase, um, with trade unions and with increasingly with NGOs and stakeholders. So um, this subject, the idea of collaboration, is very much my daily work. So um, I'll try not to be bored or boring, um, but I, I have a little bit of experience of the subject. Um, I suppose the first question I'd like to pose for the panel's discussion um, is, is it actually a good idea 
do we need to collaborate? I, I know we, we, we'd like, we're all Europeans here in one way or another. Uh, and we need to be careful about what we, how we use that word in this country these days. Um, but we are, we're all Europeans. Um, so this idea that Europeans play nicely together um, is quite interesting. Um, one, of the, one of the quotations on the program alluded to this. Um, I, I suppose a very simple response to that is it's quite a small place with quite a lot of people in it. So we either kill each other or we get on with each other, and that's pretty self-evident. So Europeans don't really have much choice. You haven't got really anywhere else to go. You've got a bit more space in other parts of the world. Um, we speak lots of different languages, so we can conveniently not understand each other when, <laughs> when it becomes too difficult. But the reality is that Europe has little choice. If you look in a, in a more serious vein at the current geopolitical um, solar system, if you like, we're looking at a world that's changing. We're looking at technological change. We're looking at the challenges of climate change. We're looking at the old order, the old rule-based order, coming under challenge. Increasingly, we see a supply-based approach being voiced by, in my experience, European governments, looking at strategic metals, the idea of critical raw materials, for example. So is collaboration something, in that sense, that we have no choice about? Is this something that is desirable? And do Europeans do it better? We have non-Europeans in the audience, and I'd really like you to tell us how good or bad you think we are, and I'd like to know how good or bad you think you are as well. I mean, I have some experience of working with other bodies in, in other parts of the world, um, but it would be really interesting to get some audience comments on your perceptions as well. So in, in no particular order, Matty, what's your views on the idea of is collaboration a good idea, and if so, are we actually making a success of it? Yeah, thanks. Well, um, I'm quite new in this in industry, and uh, and then I, I guess that from my perspective, uh, I'm still uh, trying to figure out that what are the ways how, how companies uh, do cooperation and how how the how the industry does does co cooperation uh, uh, within the industry and uh, with with the universities and uh, and uh, NGOs and so forth. And uh, my impression has has been that. Uh, that, that especially in, in the Nordics, there is a lot of uh, cooperation between the companies and between different uh, uh, universities and so forth. Uh, perhaps it is not the uh, same situation uh, uh, in, in the rest of the world. I'm, I'm not fully sure of that, but uh, the feedback that I have heard, for example, uh, has, has been uh, perhaps showing that type of uh, uh, attitude. But any, anyhow, um, to your question, I, I I don't I don't see I don't see any any other way to get uh, uh, get get business done than than to than to uh, do good collaboration, because obviously obviously uh, uh, you need to uh, you need to use all the all the wisdom that you can can have. Uh, for example, in our our, our operations, which are quite uh, complex and difficult, uh, we cannot rely only to our own. Uh, experience and uh, and and uh, and um, uh, our own, own uh, methods, but we, we also need to need to uh, use all the external external uh, professional advice that we can get. At the same time, obviously, everyone is a uh, little bit uh, scared to reveal their own business secrets, and uh, obviously, you need to have a balance between keeping your own own uh, like a business uh, and trade secrets to yourself, but also at the same time uh, revealing enough so that you can get uh, good advices from your colleagues. So I guess that uh, you, you need to find a good, good balance, balance for that. But uh, nevertheless, I, I, I don't see any, any other opportunity that, than, than to do a good co uh, cooperation between the companies and between different, uh, different uh, stakeholders. Finland has the presidency of the European Union at the moment, so thank yes. you for those good <laughs> words of guidance. Um, the, the Nordic experience is very much as, as you describe in, in, in my own understanding. There is a deep history of, of collaboration and cooperation, not only within the industry, but between different industries. There's, a, I think, a, a great creativity, and we, we can talk a little bit about that now, with perhaps with Kip's experience um, from academia in Scandinavia. My experience is that there is considerable integration between academia, research, development, and industry throughout the value chain. So, Kip, what's your views? 
Um, I'd, I'd, I'd echo your, your comments in the sense that nobody has a monopoly of knowledge. It doesn't matter who you pick, whatever. Uh, and there isn't really a problem in the industry that can't be solved without an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach. So none of us are, are, are expert in all of those areas. Um, and equally, a lot of those problems are contextual in the sense of it's particular to countries and locations and so on, which means you have to work with people with varying experience to, to really get to the, to the basic um, uh, um, reasons or, or solutions to problems. So <clears throat> collaboration, absolutely. Um, I think it's also a natural human uh, human sort of trait that you know it's it's really it, it's it's enjoyable and it's fun and it's more creative when you are working you know with like-minded individuals and can spark off each other so so let's let's not over uh, internalize it you know I think there's also a really good reason for for doing this which is because it's it's it, it, we work better as a result of that um, I also think in the European context and since you raise that uh, and why I do find uh, you know the risk of delving into politics, I do find the current situation rather depressing. Um, Europe is the only continent that during the last major mining boom did not see an increase in mining output. I think Antarctica was the only other one that had the same problem. Um, uh, every other one responded to that, that, that um, uh, increase in production. And uh, you have to ask yourself why, given that we were also you know, one of the main consumers of some of those products. Um, so so as, a, as, a, as a continent, you know, there is a, a major move, as you say, towards, you know, strategic raw material supply and how we're going to do that. Um, and, and, and what does it mean in terms of our industry base going forward? And what is the response to the kind of big big picture that China is, 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 is developing around securing its own supplies and, and how can companies operate in these sort of changing trading blocks and markets that are, that are evolving so quickly. Um, but Europe is also, as you rightly said, and I'm glad you, you pointed this out, you know, relatively small and relatively densely populated. So the model for mining in Europe is going to be different to almost anywhere else in the world. In other words, we may have uh, a need to develop the mining, you know, Europe mining 2.0 or whatever, which would not be the same solutions as, as are required in many other countries. And in fact, we've had conversations, you know, around the last few, you know, around the last day and a half uh, about some of these things uh, uh, already. So, so I think having a, a slightly European perspective may actually serve us really well in terms of what mining is going to look like as as the, the you know, future of mining uh, uh, tagline that we're, we're working to here um, moves forward. You know, Europe has got a really interesting thing to say. Well, thank you. Um, I, I could segue into a, a, a long um, promotional speech on how wonderful I think Europe is, but um, that's, what I, that's my day job. Um, I suppose a question which we all have to face, it's uncomfortable. What do we do badly? What do we miss? We received a letter in our secretariat this week from uh, the Church of England asking us to assist them in their efforts to try and identify um, potential risks of obtaining management sites in, in Europe. It's a, it's a well-known issue. The, everyone here is completely conversant with it. And it, it, it put an issue on the table that are we still bad at certain things? Are we still bad in looking after our image? Are we still bad in terms of what we call our social license to operate? And does that failure come from that lack of collaboration, that lack of cooperation? You know, are we only therefore cooperating in some ways and failing in others? So, Kip, perhaps you'd like to go. Uh, yeah, um, I think the industry is far too apologetic. Yeah. Um, I actually think, you know, if there's one problem that, w that the industry has failed to do, it's to get across the story of the you know its essential role in modern society mm. um the fact that you know yes it has done some things badly and continues sometimes to do things badly but it is uh, a vital part of, of 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 the way we live and will continue to do so in the future we haven't got industry evangelists out there in the same way as we have in other sectors and people who will stand up and 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 articulate 
articulate that properly. And, and as a result, there is a view that the industry is, you know, therefore a sunset industry. It's an industry that has its, you know, skeletons in the closet that it doesn't like uh, to be to be um, uh, looked at. Uh, and and without actually taking, you know, taking the initiative and getting on the front foot. I think a lot of the problems the industry then has around social license to operate, around being able to, uh, you know, attract the next generation of people to come into the industry to work, all of these things become problems because they are not visibly, you know, the industry is not visibly explaining what it does. Um, I think also that idea of, of um, not, uh, not always um, recognising that that the cyclical nature of the business means it's been perceived as a kind of hire and fire business, a kind of here today, gone tomorrow. Why would you go into that sector? Because, you know, things go up, they go down, you, you know, and there's a lag time between people's understanding of what's going on. Um, and it's still using old technology. It hasn't really adopted the same sort of technology we've seen in other sectors. So if you're saying, what isn't it doing well? You know, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see some of those things now happening in terms of techno technological um, uh, adoption being, you know, the absolute the order of the day. But um, what we have to do is shout about it. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Marty, in, in Finland you have a relative new government which has a very much more environmentally focused climate change based approach. And yet, you know, you are you've espoused all those values, all those goals in your earlier statements that we characterise Scandinavian industry with. How you're living exactly the issue we've ju just described. Mm. So how are you dealing with it in Finland? How are you dealing with trying to square this circle? Mm. Well, before going there, I would, I would add to uh, Kip's comment that I, I, I also fully agree that the industry's uh, reputation is not very good. And that is because uh, the public image is, uh, I would say that it's wrong. And uh, it's it's not it's not me media's fault, it's not the public's fault, but it's the industry's own fault that it, that the uh, public image is a little bit wrong, and that is because uh, there is not enough transparency, and there is not enough uh, like uh, uh, good news about about the industry. So so always when the industry is in the headlines, it, it is always about some problem, some tailings leakage or something like that, but there are never like a good news about uh, success, successful projects and, uh, and so forth. And that is something that we, we should uh, change. We should tell that uh, and elaborate that this is actually high-tech uh, industry. This is as sexy as uh, IT industry or something like that, and uh, very international, international and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and exciting business. And we should deliver, deliver that message very strongly, jointly, to the, to the uh, publicity. And now that we, like you, like you said, that we, we have a new government in, in Finland, and uh, there will be, in the governmental program, there are a lot of uh, statements related to mining industry. There are, there are a lot of statements that the Mining Act will be renewed, and there is a lot of pressure that there should be mining tax and... Uh, and, and uh, a lot of uh, new obligations to the mining companies to, to, to deal with. And, uh, and, and at the same time, we are obviously facing a situation where we, for example, need to, need to mitigate uh, climate change. We need uh, raw materials for the batteries. We need, we need a lower, lower uh, CO2 footprint for, for the whole, whole like a mining uh, and raw materials value chain. So, so obviously, uh, now, uh, at the same time, when, when we have a lot of uh, criticism uh, towards mining industry, that it's you know, uh, causing problems, environmental problems and so forth, at the same time we should uh, also consider that it's uh, perhaps more responsible to, to deal those problems in our own, own countries and do mining activities with good practices there and not only export uh, 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 or import uh, raw materials uh, from, from uh, outside of the Europe uh, and, uh, and, and uh, in, in a way uh, uh, transfer those problems to other countries. So Europe has to be responsible <coughs> there so that, uh, so that we, we take responsibility so that to those raw materials which we need, we also, also uh, produce those as much as possible. Obviously Europe's resources are not that large than in some other part of the, parts of the world. So obviously, we always need 
also also uh, external external pro production. But I think that uh, Finland and other other European count countries and European whole mining industry should be very very uh, uh, in, in a way uh, uh, strict there that they show example that they are taking these th things th taking these things uh, seriously, doing good collaboration with each other and doing good, good uh, and transparent parent collaboration with with uh, with public and NGOs. And, that, uh, and through that collaboration, uh, slowly changing the whole public image of the industry. It's, it's an interesting conversation. Um, I was speaking at a, a government event back in June in one of the southern European countries. And I, the question I asked them is, would you trust Starbucks to do your border security? And they, they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, if you look at the furore, at the the excitement that's been generated by the idea that Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk is going to mine asteroids. And yet in my, my understanding, neither of them has any experience of um, uh, inter interstellar travel or uh, mining. Um, why does that make sense? If it was Rio Tinto or Vale who was saying we want to go and mine asteroids, they would somehow be stealing the cosmos according to some of the people in the room at the time. There's something fundamentally wrong with your perceptions. You know, you don't, people just do not understand our industry, which is interesting because I, I've done a number of mine visits over recent weeks, and there's ample evidence of the use of, a deployment of cutting-edge technology. And I don't need to give you lists or examples. And one, I loved one example. I was in a Southeast European country, and they had a, a control room. Um, not unlike what you would see in Scandinavia at all. And in that control room was everything you would expect to see in terms of production. And a camera, a, 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 an image on a TV screen of a line of stickers on a board. And I said, what's that? I said, it's the stickers that we have to put on the board to show that miners are underground. And I, say, I said, I understand. So your, the regulations in your country require you to put a sticker on the board to say that Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so is underground now, yes. And so you're just making it easier for the mine inspector so they don't actually have to go to the room and look at the board, yes. So we are confronting this gap in perception in so many ways. We have a big problem of regulation in terms of perception. We have a big problem of politics in terms of understanding our industry. But also, we increasingly face challenges which I'd like to talk about and perhaps throw it out to the audience a little bit as well, in terms of what's called the ESG movement, the Environmental Sustainability and Governance Movement. We talk about ideas of sustainability. That seems to mean lots of different things to lots of people. We talk about improved governance. I don't think anyone in principle would disagree with that. Um, but then we also talk in terms of sustainable finance. Now, I'm getting a little bit unsure here as to what that means. So there seems to be this idea that we are having to deal with as an industry, and we may not be completely aware of yet, that you will be able to secure finance in the international markets driven by regulatory bodies, driven by uh, interest group pressure, only if you fulfill certain criteria. Now, as an industry, and we're not doing very well in responding to that, so my first question, perhaps, to the audience is, how many people in this audience are familiar with the Sustainable Finance Initiative? One. Anyone else? Two. Two. Okay. This is quite worrying. Um, how, many, how many of you from the industry have actually spoken to any ESG funds? One. Are you from an ESG fund? Two. Two. Sorry, I beg your pardon. The, uh, we've got a light show going in here, so I, I, I don't see the back very well. Okay, this is, this is the latest hot topic in Brussels. This is why I'm, I'm raising it. The idea is that as an industry, we are going to have to, we have to portray ourselves as a, a transformative industry, exactly what Marty was saying, that we have to portray ourselves as part of the change to the new technology, as contribu contributors to industrial change to contending with climate change issues and by working with under other industries as well. Unfortunately, there is, a, there is a enforcement movement going on today led by the financial community 
which is seeking to define industries into sustainable and not sustainable. And in Europe, we are in the process of an enormous exercise um, to try and identify our, our industry as part of it. And uh, for me, that is the best example today of why we must collaborate together. Um, Kip, coming back to you, universities perhaps don't have to contend with some of these financial issues in terms of the, the, the mining schools, but there are enormous issues that you are contending with. How do you think universities can do more and become more evident in our industry today? Uh, what I would say is actually there's been some long-term trends and the finance bit in the broadest sense, it does play out in our world, particularly because if you look at the demise of mining schools, not just in the UK, oh, but actually absolutely. worldwide, you know, this sort of, you know, going through mining cycles has led to the closure of more mining schools. You know, the US has, has managed to close most of its uh, 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 schools over a period of time. Um, and, and, and this is a, a real problem of, of how, how that sort of industry university engagement can work. If, if you look at a, on a global basis, you know, most of the mining schools that are, that are working with industry are doing so in, in sort of centres which have been funded either by wealthy alumni who've gone into the industry and are giving something back, or indeed government, private sector and, and, and uh, uh, sort of collaborations around particular topics, you know, deep mining in some places. Uh, uh, you know, there's, there's been large-scale initiatives where, where um, you know, a kind of consensus group funded out of government and industry have, have put themselves together on a single topic um, and helped fund universities uh, to, to, to work with them through that, that sort of approach. Um, the, the difficulty is uh, um, that has to be broadened into the sense of, you know, universities particularly help produce, as I say, the next generation of people going into the industry. How can industry and, and universities work cl more closely, uh, uh, you know, around curriculum al uh, alignment, around, um, you know, providing up-to-date information on what's going on in the sector to students to be able to make sure that what's coming through is what's needed. Um, how can uh, the industry work most closely with with us uh, around you know developing topics and, and research for where they see the future? Um, you know we've talked a lot about mechanisation and and, and uh, uh, digitalisation of the industries and how that's now feeding feeding through, um, and also how uh, um, the sort of disparity between between. Um, resources available in universities and in industry are sort of merged so that we're all dealing with the same same sort of resource that we can bring to bear on particular problems. We, we've got fantastic examples of working with some of the major companies on, on um, multi-university, and I see Gowan at the corner just yawning here at what I'm talking about, but, but you know, the University of Leicester and ourselves and others are working with, or, you know, a major mining company on a themed investigation of a certain type of mineral deposit in, 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 in Southern Africa uh, and, 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 you know, really sort of trying to dwell on, 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 you know, where the workings in that type of deposit may go in the future. So these are happening, but... Um, there is still this divide of kind of, you know, the academic world and academics, you know, working to an annual educational time scale, industry wanting things yesterday, who owns the intellectual property, how do you do contracting, you know, it's all of that sort of slightly mismatch of cultures. And if I could say there'd be one way we could go, it's a, it's a way you kind of blur industry and, and, and university so that, you know, there's mobility of people between them. There is a way in which you know working with industry is recognised in the in, in the university sector better. There is a, an understanding from from industry that that you know time and ideas out of academia might might be useful to you know in a, in a, an expensive environment to to to, to try out. Um, and and I guess that's something that's been said for for forty or fifty years, but you know we're still to get those models really well developed. I, I think the only example that comes to my mind is the, um, the KIC, the Knowledge Innovation yep, Community, yeah. um, and the European Institute of Technology. Um, many Scandinavian entities work together, as I've already alluded to, um, through, from research, from academia, um, through companies. But there are still barriers. Mm. Um, Marty, you're, you're dealing with them day to day. How do you deal with the fact that, at this very simple level, universities compete, research centres compete, small companies compete, be it for investors' funds or for 
exploration property. So how, how do we break those barriers down to allow people to work together in your experience? Well, obviously we need uh, kind of like structures that allow to do uh, cooperation. For example, EIT is one kind of like a structure uh, that has uh, different programs uh, under it. And, and they facilitate uh, cooperation between, between companies and institutions. Uh, uh, I would say that we, we need more that kind of, uh, kind of like uh, uh, structures and programs and, uh, and, and uh, ready-made like uh, tools that we could, we could jointly, jointly use. And, and obviously, uh, obviously also funding is needed uh, to, to, to facilitate this type of, uh, this type of like, uh, cooperation projects. Uh, but we, what we also need is that, uh, or, or we, we need uh, people, because at the end of the day, it's, this is people business. So people need to collaborate with each other, and, uh, and, and that basically means that, uh, that that it's not enough that there are there are these program uh, programs and structures, but people people need to uh, need to know each other, uh, because because uh, at the end of the day, the collaboration is based on. Uh, on, on the relations that people have with with each others, and uh, and and uh, I think that it's very important that uh, that that uh, we have a lot of uh, lot of people in in uh, companies who have a international background, so that they they have international experience. They know their colleagues from other countries, and 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 uh, through those connections, they can they can uh, facilitate uh, cooperation. And uh, obviously, from from management and from 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 directors, we need. Uh, support to, to our personnel to do that co collaboration and co cooperation so that they understand and that they have uh, uh, management and director support to, to use their time to that and uh, that it's an it's a important, uh, important part of their daily work. We, we talk about, a lot about knowledge sharing and evidencing best practice in Europe. Um, but that has somehow always gravitates towards regionalism, mm. that, you know, this limited geography that we, we recognize. And it, it really falls to the larger international companies, be they mining companies or providers or, um, I beg your pardon, <coughs> adjacent industries, again, I, I'm going to use that phrase again, to, to really deal with more global problems in, to an extent. We can all contribute to the debate. But if you want to look at, not say, commodity-based research, research, say, onto copper, that has to be global. You can't just have it in one particular locale. Um, so my, is that, I suppose it's a question more to Kip than anyone else, is that under threat by the changing world order as we see more protectionism, as we see, you know, perhaps less trade, we look at a hiccup possibly coming due to maritime fuel changes and disruption to supply as a result of that, possible price issues. But longer term, is that global issue something that we can contend with? Let me start, slightly backtrack on the point of is, it, it, you, we were talking about knowledge mm. and, and per perhaps think about knowledge and skills. Um, as an industry, we're incredibly wasteful with knowledge. Mm. And we're incredibly wasteful because we spend, you know, up cycles training people and, and creating jobs and then acquiring experience only to lose them in the down cycle and they never come back into the industry. And then in the next up cycle, there is a skill shortage which we pay handsomely for. Um, uh, uh, and then, you know, you get a new generation of people in who have to learn those same things again. Uh, uh, and then we keep that process going. So, so we hemorrhage knowledge and expertise out of the industry on a very regular basis. So if there was anything around collaboration that would be a fantastic um, uh, outcome from these sort of meetings, it would be how do we <coughs> not lose that knowledge and skill base every time? How do you protect that? Um, uh, 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 and, and that means mobility of people across sectors and it means some creative ideas. As for, as for kind of, you know, the sort of global knowledge idea and how we're working, yeah, I do fear actually that kind of the, 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 the protectionist uh, uh, um, flags are out there across, you know, uh, lots of areas. But also it's a realisation of where the industry is in the sense that if you are an operator of a mine, 
in a particular country, in a particular area, you know, your value proposition to the country is that you will be using, you know, local staff and local people, you'll be investing in local infrastructure and universities and all, all sorts of areas. And that, that, you know, unless you do that, you are not a good corporate citizen in, in that environment. Um, and that drives a lot of the decisions as, as to where things are done. Um, uh, the idea of, 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 of the industry being global is, is a given, but it's, it's also driven by some of those, those requirements. Um, but equally, it's of a scale and a reach, which means it can get you know, good people and good ideas from whatever sector uh, that there is out there. And most large companies have got uh, people who are identifying technologies, identifying ideas, identifying new business models, where, wherever they come from. Um, and, and certainly, you know, it's our job to make those as widely available as possible. And that kind of open innovation approach is one I think which the industry is gravitating towards, notwithstanding the idea that, you know, they like to have a sort of certain element of, uh, of, of their sort of, you know, unique in intellectual property. But I think most miners or most mining companies realise that kind of if you own the asset, or you own the, the rights to that deposit, then actually, you know, only having ideas that you've generated in order to, 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 to work it doesn't make any sense, really, because it's not a threat from somebody else taking it. It's just, a, uh, uh, you know, the innovation that might be available to, to do the thing better is available you know, globally. It, it's an interesting point. Um, most of you are, I'm sure, familiar with the, uh, the CETA, the uh, trade agreement between uh, Canada and the European Union. Um, that has a chapter on natural resources. Um, I'm lucky enough to be the rapporteur for that. And more or less every point you've just made is on the table for discussion in that. Mm -hmm. Those are the issues that we discuss between the European Union and Canada. So I, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I think that you know, we, we need to give that greater focus. Um, I, I suppose one point in response to what you say, again, perhaps coming from that forum is what you say is right from a Western perspective. If you're a Chinese entity, I wonder if it's also true. And if you're the host country receiving that Chinese investment and the Chinese approach, is that true? I would ask our friends in Belgrade to perhaps answer that in a couple of years' time. Um, Marty, you, Finland has a reputation for being very green very technologically open-minded, great proponents of trade, great investors in its people. Which industries are you jealous of in Finland? Which, how would you, who would you like us to emulate? Well, I would say that uh, perhaps um, if we compare ourselves to paper and pulp industry, mm. we clearly can see that uh, they have been able to, to kind of like uh, transfer the public image uh, of the industry very, very rapidly, so that uh, nowadays they are not building uh, uh, paper or pulp factories any, anymore, but they are building bio factories and uh, biomass factories and uh, generating uh, heat at the same time, for example, when, and, uh, and the whole concept uh, has, has uh, changed. At the same time, they, you know, the, the uh, environmental effects are the same as in, in mining industry very easily. But, but the whole, whole kind of image is totally different. Uh, and uh, this has been quite a uh, quite rapid change uh, that they have uh, been able to do. Kip, apart from being jealous of other university departments' budgets, what <laughs> other industries would you like us to emulate? <clears throat> There's always been a... I mean, we, we talked about uh, as, as of others... In, in some of the conversations, but there's always been a trickle down of technology from, from, from uh, it, it, you know, it tends to be military to start with, it tends to be aerospace, it tends to, you know, then go into sort of other areas, but, and, and then it comes into, you know, difficult environments like mining. Um, so, so I think it would be, it would be uh, uh, logical to sort of slightly envy them there, um, some of the sort of abilities to throw resource at, at new technologies. But, um, I, I was taken some years ago in, in, a, in an off-the-cuff talk that someone from Rio Tinto gave, actually, around the similarity in the process of trying to develop a new, uh, a new pharmaceutical product mm -hmm. to the exploration and 
you know, discovery of a deposit and bringing it into production. Um, and, and I think there's things to be learned, actually, from that process. Both of them require a large amount of money to look at a lot of possibilities, you know, uh, but all ultimately comes together into sort of one product or one mine, which kind of pays for all of that, that, that exercise. Um, and I think there's some really interesting lessons to be learned in, in actually the business models that other industries develop. I, for example, uh, you know, I don't think we're going to live in a world where mining companies stay as uh, technical entities that go in, dig things out the ground, produce concentrates or products and then sell them. I think that model is going to change fundamentally into you know, national resource managers for countries, for example. Or there's going to be a, a way in which um, uh, 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 you know, the circular economy embeds itself in what mining companies have to do. Um, uh, uh, even though they may not perceive themselves to have expertise in some of these areas. So, so I think if I were to say now, go and learn a little bit about the downstream of what goes on with, with companies' products, because I think that's going to be very useful in the next, uh, in the next decade. Yeah, I, 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 I absolutely concur. Um, I, I suppose as a sidebar to that, if we think about in the last decade or so, all the big regulatory investigations, prosecutions. You've got tech companies, you've got big pharma, you've got um, military. I'm struggling to think of large national, uh, we do have oil, a little bit on oil, but not much. But no mining company comes to mind. No mining company has, with the exception of individual events, as opposed to market practice or um, bad behaviour, you look at an individual event, say a tailings failure, that's okay, that's an industrial accident. But in terms of market regulation, the regulatory action, no mining company has been on the receiving end of any of that. Um, but if you look at the market capitalization of mining companies versus all of those industries I've, I've mentioned, they've shrunk by comparison. Um, so there's a trade-off there that you know, society seems to be willing to pay um, ladies and gentlemen, we've got, I think, just under four minutes for any questions. Um, it is a little bit difficult to see at the back, so we're very happy to take comments or questions. If you don't like us, please say so. If you think we're completely wrong, please say so. Um, there's a gentleman there, and then... Um, how are you? Nice to see you again, Nia, after that. Please. Yes, um, my name's David Pollard. I'm, a, I'm an independent geologist. Um, on the specific issue of stronger together and collaboration and talking very much in, in terms of a European context, um, I, I, I think that maybe Finland and Sweden, uh, even Serbia, is, is less guilty. But I, I do see this issue of um, when we're meant to have an EU passport and we're meant to be able to work in each other's country, um, big barriers being put up in terms of mining personnel working in, um, in other countries. Uh, I've worked all over the world, uh, and yet I've never worked in Europe in the mining industry. Uh, in my previous career, uh, which was as a petroleum geologist, I have worked in Europe. So I think this is, a, this is an issue where there is... Um, great potential for development. And I think particularly in, in Spain and Portugal where, oh, no, 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 we don't need you because we've got our own geologists. Mm -hmm. But if we would work in collaboration, I think that we could actually end up um, working together that much better. And I, I understand there's the issue of language, um, but for me that is not a, a, an issue because I speak the local language. Um, if I could perhaps repl reply, um, some, you're absolutely right, and a lot of people are focused on that. There's a lot of work being done um, by the Commission, for example, at the moment, with us and other bodies, to address that very problem. Um, some companies, um, Boliden, for example, fly a different flag. I think it's at ITEC for every new nationality they employ, and they're up to 65 now. Um, but there's not enough of that. 
we, we need to have cross-fertilization, otherwise it just doesn't work. We, we understand that. It's like leaving the, the baking soda out of the cake. It's not going to rise properly. Um, so absolutely, you're right. I agree with you. It needs to have more prominence as an issue, but this is an issue that is being addressed in many different ways. So uh, you're, you're right to raise it. Gentlemen, I don't know if you'd like to respond as well. I, I'd just make one small point. There's, there's an, a, a series of EU projects, actually, about... Uh, uh, you know how how raw material supply in, e in the EU could work, and how the mining industry could could develop more effectively. Um, it, there's one of those projects called Intraw, and in that it's about a raw material observatory and various other things. But it's also about how you know things that could be done by industry and universities and governments and and, and re regulators and NGOs and all sorts of other people to kind of achieve the things that you're talking about, and some of those collaboration routes and by way of you know, people from different countries working together are in that report. And I'd, I'd just point you in that direction to, to, to have a quick look at some of the thoughts that came out. Uh, one last comment from Nia over there. Um, I had a question for Matti. Um, sort of from Terrafame's uh, point of view, um, how are you working on better transparency and openness um, just to boost, boost collaboration and um, the perception of the industry, I guess? Well, when we, when we started the uh, ramp-up of the uh, current operation four years ago, the, uh, the kind of like uh, uh, PR policy and communications policy started from the principle that uh, uh, Terraformers communications uh, are transparent, up-to-date, and, and all relevant information will be disclosed. And we have, uh, we have uh, obeyed that policy basically in every every turn that there has been so so basically all the uh, all the uh, substantial uh, uh, events and uh, all, all the substantial uh, information is, is disclosed without without any any delays and and, and obviously obviously there is uh, quarterly uh, press conferences and press releases the uh, challenge a uh, little bit is that uh, and this relates to what i said earlier that uh, it's very difficult to get uh, good news through in, in media so whenever there is some problem the media is very eager to, to write articles about that and uh, big big headlines but if you have good news it's very very difficult uh, even though that you do your best and uh, use all the communication channels but it's very difficult to get those messages uh, through in, in media. What we also do is, is that we, we every year do a big uh, survey where we uh, investigate that what is the public perception of the company so that we have uh, like a national level uh, uh, survey, then we have local, regional, re regional uh, 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 part of the survey. We have uh, uh, also, also uh, uh, media as one one uh, one group there, uh, political decision makers, makers, uh, industry in, uh, in, industry uh, decision make makers, and what what is interesting is that uh, we always get best results uh, from local people and from uh, uh, people who work in the uh, in different industries. So not necessarily in mining industry, but who are like. Uh, uh, companies like uh, subcontractors or, or uh, pro pro uh, providing ut utilities or, or other, other like a big big companies in Finland and uh, and uh, that is very interesting that that, that those those uh, groups that have, have have best information they give best best uh, kind of like uh, feedback but uh, uh, pe people like journalists and people who work who, who work for the media they give they give the lousiest uh, <laughs> results and because of that, the, the kind of like a national level uh, uh, perception is, uh, is 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 lower, and I think that that is that is uh, something uh, from which we can we can learn that uh, that uh, whenever we can give more information and give uh, give uh, like a, uh, uh, like get our message 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 through, then it helps to build that uh, trust and help helps to uh, help helps to uh, build a better corporate image. But it is very difficult. Uh, Kip would like to make one intervention before we set you free for coffee. I just want to say, by way of, of actually sort of summarising on this point, um, I've, I've been looking around the room, and, and, and one of the things that coming to a lot of meetings talking about about mining, you notice is the both the gender balance and indeed the age profile in the room. And, and it may just be a function of the fact that this is a future of mining, that we do actually have a little better gender balance, and we have more younger members of the industry in here, which I think is actually very healthy and very much to be applauded. 
but the industry is facing a demographic crisis, um, which means that you guys are in really good shape because you know most of the people who, who are retiring out of companies you know, with 30, 40 years of experience are about to go, and the headroom you guys are going to see in the industry is fantastic. Um, but uh, as an industry, you know, that issue that, that universities and, in, and, 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 and companies need to work together on is a massive skills gap in running some of the world's biggest engineering projects uh, um, uh, with people who are learning fast on the job. So exciting times for everybody, but um, you know, watch this space. Kip, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.